Welcome back to another Men of Iron podcast with Ryan Zook, and I'm Tony Galati, and we're going to be talking about friendship in the Bible, and I think you know a little bit about this. You know what's interesting? Um, a lot of times I've heard people say, like, ah, the Bible just doesn't say much about friendship. The reality is it, it says a lot more about a lot of other things. Uh, but there are a couple examples of really solid friends in the Bible. And I would say that the first one we'll pick up from last week. Um, you can look at how Jesus conducted himself with his disciples. Obviously, it's not, you know, like, you're not Jesus. I'm not Jesus. Obviously, it's a little bit different. Um, but kind of what we talked about last week in that Jesus, uh, his closest friends, was maybe the, those three guys that he did everything with. Mm -hmm. They were believers. They might have struggled in their belief. Uh, they kind of came and went with what they thought about Jesus, but they landed in a place where they were confident about him being God and being their savior. Then there was the 12, and the 12, again, were believers, basically, except for Judas, which we could probably do a whole separate podcast yeah. on. You want to do that? Yeah. <laughs> um, and then when you expand that circle out, he starts to interact with a lot of people from a lot of different backgrounds that may have been believers, may not have been believers. Maybe they were questioning people. And so Jesus is, on the surface, really well known for spending a ton of time with tax collectors and sinners. That's what the Bible calls them, basically, uh, with not great people. And so sometimes people will say, like, well, Jesus spent all his time with sinners. That's not actually true. Like, he actually spent way more of his time with the disciples, uh, training them up to be able to, to take over the work that he was setting up for them to do. Uh, but he did also spend time with tax collectors and sinners, which is why people did not like him. And so he sets kind of an example for us, I think, in that he had close associations with people that did not believe in, in him, that were not Christians. He always called them to repentance. He always told them to leave their life of sin. Uh, but his closest personal relationships, you could say his friendships, um, were people who were committed to him, committed to the mission, committed to the kingdom of God. And ultimately, most of them gave their lives um, to support and further the kingdom of God. So I think he sets up one example for us. I think it's a, a very overlooked example. Yeah. Because let's say you never heard the story before and you heard God's coming to earth is the first thing you think is you're going to go find some friends. Yeah. I'd be like, yeah, that's God doesn't do that. Dude, It's if you really want to dig deep into that side of things, um, you can look at the beginning of each gospel, kind of has a section about Jesus calling his disciples. And you can see how intentional he is in calling people who would not have been called to be disciples. Mm -hmm. uh, it was very normal for Jewish rabbis, especially famous ones, uh, to call people to be their disciples so that they would follow them. So this was not a unique thing that Jesus was doing. Uh, but a lot of times they would call people who were rich, who mm -hmm. were influential, who had famous parents, who could get them something. Yep. But instead, uh, Jesus calls people who have no re uh, reputation who have no money, it, for the most part, they're like poor fishermen. They have no formal education for the most part. Uh, and some of them um, were tax collectors and zealots. So they were like total outcasts. Some of them were actually doing violent crimes. Mm. And Jesus is like, hey, come follow me. And they become this close-knit uh, group of people committed to Jesus. They were sometimes confused. They did not always understand what he was up to. Uh, but they were valuable relationships to him, I'm sure. Why, why do you think he did that? Uh, one, I think like he was setting up the mission of the church to move forward. Mm -hmm. So I think a big part of what Jesus was doing, well, I mean, one, it was ordained by God. Like he, he was going to do what he was tasked to do. Uh, but, but like the vast majority of those guys end up leaving Jerusalem, leaving Judea and going to like the outskirts of the world empowered by the Holy Spirit to build churches and instruct believers. And so in, in a large sense, um, we have Christian faith today, one, because of Jesus, of course, mm -hmm. but two, because of those faithful men that stayed on task after they were empowered by the Holy Spirit to do what Jesus had asked them mm -hmm. to do. So we have a huge debt um, to those faithful men, to, to the guys who were essentially Jesus' friends, yeah, right? Like right. They, they were his friends. They did life together. They, they went out fishing together. Um, they went out on journeys together. They hiked all around that area together. So they spent a lot of time together. They were definitely friends. Uh, minus Judas, I guess. Which just was friend for a little while. One small while. detail there that yeah. kind of became a problem. Um, but I think I think it is an overlooked example of friendship because we like to spiritualize things, and obviously there's a spiritual thing going on there, but there's also a very personal, very human thing going on there yeah. that is Jesus has close friends. Yeah. 
another another friend I think you talked about yesterday in our pre meeting is Lazarus was a really close friend of Jesus, right? Yeah. Well, that affected him so much, right? When Lazarus died, I, I think, boy, I'd love to hear a little bit more about that yeah. relationship. Yeah. Yeah. We know that like he had Jesus had many friends. Uh, there there were many strong personal relationships that he had. Uh, some with men, some with women, and it's it's a good example for us to follow. I think. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I. I like what you said about, you know, like he, he called the disciples because the disciples had to carry on the work after, right? And I sure. think a lot of people, and myself included, for a long time just looked at it like, well, that was the purpose. But what about like when he's going to pray and he comes back and he's like, man, you couldn't even stay awake for, for a little while with yeah. me? Like, that's, a, that's a friend favor. That's- you know what's funny about that? If you go back and read the Gospels, um, there, that's a huge scene, right? Where he's, he's about to be arrested. He's praying on the Mount of Olives. Um, he's overwhelmed with emotion because he knows what's coming. Mm-hmm. And he's so disappointed when he finds his disciples yeah. falling asleep over and over again. It's not just once. If you look at the chapters that happened before that, he's constantly telling them, be awake, mm. be prepared. Like he literally tells them, stay awake be on guard yep. and like the moment comes and they're like they're total bums yep. they're just like oh, yeah we're really tired jesus sorry man and he's like he's like crying blood yeah yeah <laughs> i think about that a lot and i i'm just like what kind of friends were these right, these? right. But, man i could probably point the finger at myself and and be like exactly. when would when was i not there oh, for goodness. somebody well how many times have you known about something that is happening to one of your friends at least for me 100 percent, i've known about things that are happening like oh, i should really do something and then I'm like, oh, I forgot to do something. Yeah. Or like, like uh, I just never got a date on the calendar. Somebody reached out and said, hey, I, I would love to get together. Oh, man, I would love to get together too. I would, that would be so great. Text back and forth. Sounds amazing. Let's do something. Nothing happens. Yep. You don't hear anything from them for six months. Like That's a, that's a huge fail. Mm-hmm. Um, and in some ways, the disciples had huge fails with Jesus. But Jesus is so gracious, so compassionate. Uh, God continues his plan. Uh, through the friendships that Jesus has. Yeah. It's, it's super interesting. Yeah, that's, that is a great example. What's some other ones? Dude, okay, so let's talk about David and Jonathan. Okay, that's a good one. Uh, so David and Jonathan, if you're not familiar with that story, uh, you can read over it. it kind of The story kind of picks up in 1 Samuel 18. It's kind of a longer story, so it runs all the way through like 2 Samuel 9 is kind of the cap on the end of that long-term relationship. It makes people really uncomfortable, to be honest. Uh, because when you start to dig into the details of David and Jonathan, uh, the Bible actually says some weird stuff about them. It really does. And and over history, uh, people have actually looked at David and Jonathan and been like, hey, I think they were actually a lot more than just friends. Uh, and that's nonsense. Like, they, they were not in some kind of romantic relationship. I want to be upfront about that. And if you read over the story, you might be led to think that because we don't live in the same kind of culture mm-hmm. that they did. So kind of their cultural practices were a little bit different. Their relationship was a little bit different. But you can see an incredible commitment that Jonathan has with David, which is something you kind of resonated with, I think. Yeah, so like how did their relationship start? Uh, okay, so so let's just set up the story. Yeah. Um, God decides to give Israel a king. They're not supposed to have a king. They're supposed to follow solely God. They're supposed to be committed to God. They want to be like everybody else. They want a king. Mm. Um, God gives them a king in Saul. Saul is at first a pretty godly leader, but quickly gives in to his own selfishness, his own ambition, um, and he's, he's drawn quickly away from God. So Saul is Israel's first king. His son is Jonathan. Jonathan is obviously supposed to be the next king. Key point. Key point. Like, like the throne is his. He just has to wait until his dad dies. Well, at the same time, David shows up on the scene um, behind the scenes, David is already anointed as king because God sees what's going on in Saul. God understands that Israel needs a king that loves and follows God. So David is anointed king, but will not become king for many, many, many years. So even that story is kind of interesting how that all plays out. Um, but David meets Jonathan and they hit it off as friends. And it really doesn't make sense because um, David and Saul, Jonathan's father, are essentially like political rivals. Mm-hmm. Uh, it'd be like it'd be like um, Hunter Biden becoming best friends with Don Jr. Like that just seems a little bit weird, <laughs> right? Yeah. And yeah. sometimes when we talk about like real world examples, it makes you like a little bit uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. But that's how it would have felt, right? And not only uh, Hunter Biden becoming best friends with Don Jr., it'd be like Hunter Biden saying, "You know what, Don? We are best friends. I'm committed to the leadership of your father." 
Can you imagine any scenario currently where that would happen? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's what makes this relationship scandalous. Mm. I think about, so g sticking with that, so Jonathan is next in line. Yeah. To be the king. phone is his. It's not even like he doesn't have to earn it. He, has, he doesn't have yeah. to do anything to get right. it. It's his. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I've been watching a lot of documentaries lately, like Alexander the Great, just like different things in history. Yeah. How badly these people, Caesar, how badly these people wanted to rule. Yes. And Jonathan doesn't have to do anything. It's just, it's, it, it, it should be his. Yes. So not only does he not get it, but he is best friends with the guy that does. Mm -hmm. How good of a friend is that? I want you to see how good of a friend this is. This is 1 Samuel 18. So 1 Samuel 18, uh, this is covered in verses 1 to 4. I'll just highlight one little piece. It says, And Jonathan made a solemn pact with David because he loved him as he loved himself. Mm. Jonathan sealed the pact by taking off his robe and giving it to David together with his tunic, sword, bow, and belt. Mm. That sounds a little bit weird because mm. like, when we make friends, we don't give him our clothes. Not usually. He's not giving him his clothes. He's giving him all the things that represent his authority. And so he's essentially saying, like, David, I see what God is doing in your life. I'm going to make a pact with you. I'm going to commit to you. And all of the authority that should go to me is going to go to you because I'm more concerned about God's plans than my plans. Mm. And that plays out over years of Jonathan being committed to David because they're both committed to God. Yeah. I don't think he gets enough credit. It's crazy. Right? Yeah. A hundred percent. We don't talk about Jonathan a lot. No. No, we, we talk about David a lot. We talk about David a lot. Yeah. 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 And, and the story gets crazier because Saul decides I'm going to murder David. And like over years, Saul is trying to murder David. And Jonathan actually thwarts those plans mm -hmm. to make sure that David is protected. And he renews his pact. You can actually see in uh, 1 Samuel 23, uh, Jonathan actually says, my father will never find you. You are going to be the king of Israel and I will be next to you as my father Saul is well aware. So the two of them renewed their solemn pact before the Lord and Jonathan returned home. So Jonathan knows what's up. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would just love to have a more intimate look at Jonathan's walk with God. Because to do something like that, I mean, I'm sure he, he probably had people around him being, this is the dumbest thing you could possibly oh, do. Oh, 100%. Because these, these royal kingdoms, like they have advisors, they have counselors. Just like today, like there are politicians that are trying to get to the top, right? What Jonathan's doing is insane. Yeah. Right. Yeah. How many times in our life do we say, God, this this doesn't really make sense. Are you, are you sure you're telling me to right. do this on a much smaller scale? Right. Right. And he is giving up everything. 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 So his his relationship with God had to be absolutely... It was the most important thing in his life. And I, I think that is the biggest point of this whole friendship conversation Yes, David and Jonathan were great friends, 100%. But they were great friends because they served a great God together. Mm. And that actually strengthened their friendship. Because when we serve God, he's the most important thing in our lives. Then we serve other people. So we make decisions that don't make sense because we're invested in serving others like Christ has served us. Yeah. And so Jonathan is serving David uh, like Christ has served the church. And their faith is an incredible example to us, and their friendship is an incredible example to us. So the, the sad part is um, Saul is killed. On the same day, Saul's sons are killed. Like, like his family is essentially wiped out uh, as a judgment from God. And later on, David is the king. And David decides, hey, I want to know if there are any of Saul's relatives left on the earth. So when a king says that... Um, People do not assume like, oh, he's trying to make more friends. Right. That's really cute. Like, no, it's like, oh, round him up. Yeah. We're killing off yeah, the line. We're, we're going to murder everybody uh, so that David's uh, rule is concrete. But David actually pulls together anybody that's left. He finds this guy, uh, Mephibosheth, uh, who is actually so, uh, Jonathan's son, I believe, um, because he wants to give kindness uh, to Jonathan and to Saul's family. So even how well... Uh, David serves Jonathan after Jonathan's dead. He continues to show kindness uh, to his friend and to his friend's family, which again, would not have made sense. He is compassionate because he is serving God. And actually Mephibosheth ends up being a little bit sketchy uh, and not always doing the best thing 
Uh, but David is so committed to his friend Jonathan that he continues to serve him even after he's died. Mm. It's wild. I'm I'm trying to think of like a real life story. Yeah. How we could relate this because if you listen to the podcast mm-hmm. and you go, oh, that's a really cool story. Jonathan was a really good guy. That's yeah. like, it's not really the point. Like, how could we apply that type of obedience and friendship? And this is not going to do it justice yeah. at all. Yeah. But, you know, in a real life example, I think um, you, you're going for this position in a job. You're going to be the head of the company. Mm-hmm. And then there's another guy mm-hmm. that's also in the running. Yeah. And you realize that's the guy that that should have it. And you say, I don't need the salary increase. I don't need the company car. I don't need to be in charge. You're the one who needs to be there. That, like, even in that example, it doesn't really, it's not, it's not great enough compared to what Jonathan did. But even in that example, 99% of the people would be like, yeah, I, I, I just would never do that. That's dumb. Yeah. I need to provide for my family. Right. Uh, you know, I want to work my way up. This is what I went to school for. This makes zero sense. I'm not doing it. But I think that example could show just on a very small scale what what he did. Because God was at the center of their relationship, all of their other relationships were stronger. Mm. And so because Jonathan and David both were primarily concerned about the Lord's will, their friendship was stronger. And it's the same way for all of us. Like if you are solely focused on serving the Lord and you find a friend who is also solely focused on serving the Lord, you will get closer to God as you get closer to to each other and you will be able to serve God's kingdom well together. That's why I keep saying over and over, if you are a man and you are listening to the podcast, you need a friendship like this because it will benefit you. It will benefit your friendships. It will benefit your family. It will benefit your company. Like when you serve God, everything else in your life will be better. It might not be, you know, on the surface, you might not look at it and be like, well, I'm richer. I have more influence. I have more power. Jonathan didn't do that, but his life was better because he was serving God. Yeah. Um, You talk about like this, this incredible handoff, uh, like you're kind of rising up through the company, right? Uh, But you notice somebody who actually would serve the company better. I think that is a really great example of what happened with Saul and Barnabas Mm. Uh, because Barnabas in the early church is a guy that has a lot of uh, reputation He has a lot of influence. He has a lot of money, actually. Um, And people looked up to him. And Barnabas, if you know much about him, he takes a shot on this guy that people are terrified of named Saul because Saul's favorite pastime is killing people, (laughs) killing Christians, actually. And Barnabas is the one that's like, you know what? I I met this Saul guy. Um, I know that God has been working in his life. You can read this for yourself in Acts 9. This is Acts 9, 26 to 27. And Barnabas sticks his neck out and says, there's something going on in that guy's life. I want to invest in him because I think if I serve him, it will be good for the kingdom. Mm. And there comes a time where Barnabas has no more influence. We don't hear about him at all. And we hear about Paul, Saul, uh, Saul became Paul. We hear about him over and over and over again. We don't read any letters that Barnabas wrote. Uh, And there was a time in his life where he was more influential than Saul, than Paul. Mm. But he gladly handed off that influence and that authority because he wanted to serve God and God's kingdom. And their relationship was stronger because of it. Yeah, another amazing example. I'm, I'm thinking of a challenge. Yeah, I'm thinking how what would be a good challenge this week? I'd say maybe look for opportunities where maybe there's something that could be very beneficial for you, but but God is maybe wanting to raise somebody else, or for you to give your influence to somebody else. Yeah, I, I tell you what, that sets up next week fantastic because next week we're going to talk about moving from friendship into mentorship. So it's almost like, Hey, think about somebody that could benefit uh, by being your friend, like somebody you could serve well and help push them even further than you've gone. Mm. Um, and think about ways that you could invest in that person. Yeah. So if you are somebody that's listening and you've been serving God for a long time, maybe you should be looking for somebody to invest in, uh, like Barnabas did with Paul or, Maybe you're like, man, I just, I just really need help. Like, I, I don't understand this Christian walk thing. I know I want to serve God, but I need help. You need to be looking for a Barnabas uh, that will be willing to invest in you and push you further. Uh, I'm excited about that as a challenge because we're going to be digging into that again next week. You don't want to miss that. Yeah, and it doesn't sound like it, but influence, you know, that's leadership. Oh, 100%. So where it 100%. sounds like you're taking this submissive, uh, you know, uh, um, you're just looking at this as, 
I, I'm not going to do this. I'm backing away. You're actually influencing someone else, which is, which is an act of leadership. Mm -hmm. And I just think that's, uh, to build into somebody else's life is just something that we all need to be looking to do. So I'd say, think about that this week. How could we do that? Who could we influence this week? Who could we encourage this week? And we'll be back next week. And next week we're talking about friendship to mentorship. Friendship to mentorship. All right. Well, we'll close it out next week. We'll see you then. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for listening to the Men of Iron podcast. If you enjoyed that episode, you can go to our website, menofiron.org. You can also like that episode. You can ring the notification bell or you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. But again, thanks for listening to the Men of Iron podcast.